Maybe it was the killing of the lion when he was a teenager. Maybe it's the fact that he killed a lion and a bear with his own hands. Eric mentioned David wanting to build the temple. Maybe the temple, the great temple builder comes to mind. Maybe it was the fact that he committed adultery and then had Bathsheba's husband killed. Psalm 26 is a psalm that David writes, and I would encourage you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 26, page 459 in the Bible review. But David writes in Psalm 26 about God examining his heart. And this morning as we study through Psalm 26, we too need to undergo a heart examination. Many of us have had our physical hearts examined. When I was in graduate school, I was living with some friends of mine and took a nap one Saturday afternoon and got up and went to the bathroom and passed out. Hit my face on the corner of the lavatory. Went to the doctor to have an EKG done. They decided I was like the, the bridge. The heart was too small. Spiritually speaking, we have to periodically examine our hearts. Queen Victoria, one time was traveling through the highlands and visiting her subjects, and she was not dressed apparently as the queen, but she went into this one lady's house who was blind, and she sat down there and she visited with this lady. Had a very pleasant visit. And then when the queen got up and left and all her entourage went out the door, somebody mentioned to this lady that it was in fact Queen Victoria who was visiting her house. And the lady got up and went over and picked up the chair where the queen sat. And she took it into a spare bedroom. And she said, nobody is ever going to sit on that chair again because my lady the queen sat in that chair. You and I need to get thrown Christ on our hearts. And we need to treat our heart that way. Jesus is the master of the heart and nobody or nothing else is going to take his place. So I want us to look at Psalm 26 and examine our hearts as David calls on God to look at his heart. First of all is the call to judgment or the call to vindication, depending on your translation, verses 1 through 3. Vindicate me, O Lord. The original word means to judge. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. And I have walked in your truth. How could David write that? There are three major sins that are mentioned about David. Of course, we're most familiar with the Bathsheba and Uriah, but David also counted his men in the context of putting trust in his military. And that is a sin that is mentioned a couple of times in the Old Testament. Now there are a few other things. Oh, we're almost hesitant to call them minor things because those are the three that are mentioned more often. So David did at least the big two that we sometimes think of. So how is it that David can go to God and say, God, vindicate me for I have walked in my integrity. Well, David, of course, wanted to serve God in his heart. Yesterday morning at the devotional at the, uh, the men's breakfast, I talked about the continental divide that runs along the western part of the United States from up into Canada down across the Rocky Mountains 
not separate uh, basically where rain falls. If rain lands along the western side of the continental divide, it ends up in the Pacific Ocean. If it winds up on the eastern side of the continental divide, it eventually winds up in the Atlantic Ocean. And I pointed out that all of mankind is divided up into two broad categories, and it all depends on our approach to Jesus. Do we humbly submit to Jesus' authority? We end up on one side. Do we not accept Jesus' authority? We end up on the other side. David ends up on the side of those who love God. Despite his behavior, despite how he lives sometimes, beside, uh, despite the, uh, the isolated decisions that he made that were wrong, in a big way, he took a man's life. In David's heart, he says, I walk in my integrity. I want to do what's right. My behavior sometimes is wrong, but my heart is right, he says, because I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. He wanted to honor God in his heart. David was a balanced individual. Today we sometimes talk about the relationship between faith and works. Notice how David mentions faith and works in verse 1. First of all, he says, I have trusted in the Lord. There's his faith. He knew that God would ultimately work things out for his good. He trusted God. He knew that he needed to obey the law of Moses. Later on, he'll talk about worship. He'll talk about the altar. David was an individual who worshipped God and honored God through his worship. So there's his trust. But before that, he says, I walk in my integrity. There's his works. He knew that he had to obey God, not just accept God intellectually, but he had to obey God. He had to walk. He had to have a lifestyle that honored God. And David did that. But then he also had the motivation, integrity, perfection. The word translated integrity here means perfection. It means completeness. And so David tried to serve God in that way. And so in verse 2, David says to God, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. The word examine there comes from the area, comes from the field of metallurgy. How do you purify metals? You heat them up. David says, put my mind and my heart to the test. The word translated mind there is most often translated heart, and the word translated heart literally means the kidneys, or I should say the kidneys. It's, it's the intestines. And the ancient peoples believed that your emotions stem from here inside, around your stomach area, your kidney area. They believe that's where your emotions came from. So when David says, God, examine my mind, my heart, and my intestines, he is saying, God, look at me at the, at the most deepest level and put me to the test. Examine me, God, and see if I do not honestly and sincerely, deep down inside, want to serve you. I want to do what's right. Verse 3 is his motivation. Because your loving kindness is always before my eyes. The word loving kindness here is a word in the Hebrew that carries a lot of weight to it. The word loving kindness means, for example, God's dedication to his covenant that he made with Abraham. And in fact, that he made with David. God promised David, you will always have someone sitting on your throne. And that person, of course, today is Jesus Christ. So God was dedicated to His covenant. It also carries the idea of faithfulness to the covenant. So that if the people on the other side of the covenant, the Israelites in this case, or David in this case, more specifically, if they are not faithful to their part of the covenant, God is still going to be faithful to His part of the 
The Apostle Paul reminds me and you of this aspect of God's nature in 2 Timothy chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, I believe, where Paul says, if we are faithless towards God, if we doubt sometimes, we don't live exactly like we ought to do sometimes, God is still faithful. God is still faithful, dedicated to the covenant that He had made with you and me in Jesus Christ. But then this word loving kindness also carries with it the idea of love. And that's why it's translated this way here. God loves the other people who are involved in this covenant. Whether it was the Israelites, whether it was David himself, or whether it's you and me and Jesus Christ. God loves us. And God is patient with us. And God is faithful to His covenant. And He will fulfill it. So David calls on God, look at me, God. And understand that I walk, notice what he says in verse 3, I walk in your truth. In the New Testament, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Hebrew writer says that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so we have the ability to look at God's Word. To study God's Word on a daily basis and pray that God try my mind and my heart. One of the benefits of reading God's Word is to see what is it that I'm doing right. And let me be encouraged by that. What is it that I am doing wrong? And let me correct that. God's Word points out what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And so one way today in which God tests our minds and our hearts is through telling us in His Word what He expects. Well, let's look further at David's thoughts about his lifestyle because in verses 4 and 5, he talks about his associations. Notice what he says about the people that he spends time with. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I was having a Bible study this last week with a couple here in Paris and she was talking about living a life of sin, not regular sin, but frequent periodic sin. And I pointed out one way that we can not live a life of sin is to be in worship. To be in worship, to surround ourselves with people who are also trying to do the right thing. Now, we can't pull ourselves out of the world entirely. God doesn't call us to do that. He doesn't call us to become monks and nuns. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. But at the same time, we are to be careful of our companionship. Because evil companionships corrupts good morals, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33. And so here, Paul says, I'm careful about who I have friends with. And that's why Paul says, I love to go to worship. It's easy to be a Christian in worship. It's easy to be a Christian when you're surrounded by other Christians. When you're surrounded by people who have the same attitude towards God, towards morality, biblical morality. That's the easy part. And that's why we need to do it more frequently. And so David says, I'll watch you while I spend time with you. But then notice what he says. Beginning in verse 6. He goes back and talks about this idea of integrity. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. <laughs> integrity. The root word of that word integrity is integer. Do you remember what the definition of an 